Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our April 2022 meeting of the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum. My name is Tim Bruno, and I serve as the Chief of the Office of the Great Lakes for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and I'm joined by my colleagues Amber Stillwell, the Coastal Outreach Specialist at the Erie Office of Pennsylvania Sea Grant, as well as a Sea Grant staff person Kelly Donaldson, who is helping to facilitate the online Zoom meeting today. For those of you that are new to the P, uh, Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum, uh, this meeting hosts informational sessions that allows participants to gain a deeper knowledge and appreciation of the environmental issues that affect our Great Lakes. We do this not only with special attention to those issues that affect our water quality and our water quantity, but also how they impact our lives and our communities. We strive to bring you some of the leading experts from within the Great Lakes Basin and outside of it so you can take knowledge with you that you gain here, such as today's topics of uh, PFAS, uh, as well as learning about um, some of the local uh, work that our partners have been doing within the region and uh, share it with your friends and your families and colleagues. So one forum update that we have for you here today is that Pennsylvania DEP and uh, PAC grant um, you know, we've utilized some, uh, some upcoming Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding to extend the Pennsylvania LEAF over the next 12 months. And so we're happy to, to announce that, uh, that Amber and everyone at Sea Grant will, will host an additional four meetings, this one included, um, over, over those months. And we'll be able to, uh, to take the feedback that you give us, as well as some of your recommendations on topics that you'd like to hear about. Also, we've taken some of the feedback from the previous forums that we've had, and we've slightly revised uh, the format uh, to provide that information that you need in a more concise form. So we'll be interested to receive your feedback uh, to let us know more about what your needs are uh, coming out of these meetings and recommend recommendations to make the forum beneficial to the Lake Erie Basin. And I'm sure Amber will, will tell you a little bit about uh, a questionnaire that she's going to be, uh, to be circulating. So today, um, I expect that you'll hear these themes from our presenters. Uh, we'll get a chance to hear from a DEP, DEP expert about per and polyfluoroalkyl substances in, in surface waters. These might be new to some of you folks. You might have seen things in the news uh, about these substances and want to learn more. But uh, they do affect humans. They do affect ecosystems. And uh, we'll hear more about what Pennsylvania is learning about their presence here and what we're doing about uh, actions inside of our drinking water regulations uh, to help uh, protect the public and uh, public health. We'll also hear about uh, from Penn Future regarding progress on the common agenda for Lake Erie. We'll hear an overview from the Erie County Department of Health on upcoming 2022 harmful algal bloom monitoring and detection activities. And finally, it's Earth Day week. And so we're going to hear all about the activities that are occurring around our region, what you can participate in. And um, I, I haven't even made up my mind yet as to, to which ones I'm going to, going to be going out to. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. So um, Amber, I, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, introduce yourself and, and, you know, let everyone know a little bit more about the format here today. And uh, and any questions that may, they might have. Okay, thank you, Tim. Hi, everyone. As Tim said, I am Amber Stowell. I'm a Coastal Outreach Specialist in the Lake Erie Office with Pennsylvania Sea Grant. I also work for Penn State Extension as the Master Watershed Steward Coordinator for Erie, Warren, and Crawford Counties. And today is our virtual Pennsylvania LEAF meeting. We have had great success with our virtual meetings and received attendance from across Pennsylvania and the Great Lakes and Mid-Atlantic region. I encourage you right now to write in the chat what city or state you're tuning in from so we can get a better idea of who is joining us today and from where. A few logistics before we get started. Most of us are pretty familiar with the Zoom platform platform by now, but if you have questions, please direct them to the Q&A box. Those questions will be answered by our speakers uh, in the preferential. If you do type things into the chat, then we'll try to get to those questions as well, but they can be a little bit more difficult if um, a lot of people are typing in at once. So uh, feel free to use that Q&A box or the chat feature. And if we don't get questions answered, we will direct those questions 
um, after the meeting to the presenters and get those answers out to you in the notes when they follow. This meeting is being recorded and we will pass along a link to that recording early next week. The recording and the notes from this meeting will also be available on the Pennsylvania Sea Grant website. With that, thank you. And I will turn it back over to Tim for a few Great Lakes updates. Great, thanks. And so as always, I'll try to keep my updates brief as we only have two hours here and we have a lot of uh, information to cover. That being said, if there's ever any questions that arise regarding Great Lakes water quality, quantity, or how uh, Pennsylvania views policy on the Great Lakes, feel free to reach out to the office of the Great Lakes. Um, you can contact me directly at tibruno at pa.gov. That's my email address or 717-798-6001. And uh, as Amber mentioned, we have been getting participation from not only in Pennsylvania, but all over uh, the Great Lakes Basin, as well as along the Mid-Atlantic for, uh, for participants who are interested in the topics that we've been covering. So first and foremost, uh, even though if you've heard it before, I'll give you a little information about the Office of the Great Lakes at uh, Pennsylvania DEP. And in normal times, we're located in the Tom Ridge Environmental Center uh, at the head of Presque Isle State Park in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, but we've been working uh, remotely mostly for the last two years. The office has a focus on Great Lakes water quality and quantity and linking the community with the resource. We coordinate with the US and Canadian federal agencies and other states and provinces to address water use and water quality challenges. We work within the Great Lakes governance structures, uh, both federal organizations and interstate compacts to, uh, to assure that Pennsylvania is well represented and has a strong voice. We place emphasis on forming local community partnerships to encourage municipal and county cooperation and protect the environment. We have numerous programs that, uh, that, that reach out and work with our county partners on a host of uh, water quality and quantity issues. And you'll hear about one of those uh, today where we talk about uh, harmful algal bloom, monitoring detection and response and how we deal with that. Likewise, we also develop water quality um, and land protection programs to help uh, bring in and prioritize funding in Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, as I move on here, uh, you know, there are some updates as to, um, to invasive species inside the basin. If you remember um, the last time we spoke, uh, we had some updates from um, the Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Joliet, Illinois. And uh, the states and the provinces have been working diligently to, um, to have protections and deterrence put in place there to avoid invasive carp coming from the Mississippi River Basin and uh, entering into the Great Lakes. So far, those, those have been successful, but there is a very large project that has been um, under continuous design and engineering uh, at the Brandon Road Lock and Dam to include additional deterrence. And this is an $868 million project, um, one that we hope that will garner 100% uh, federal funding um, in, in the future. And so the states and the provinces have been working uh, toward that end and uh, to, to try to, uh, to secure that funding. Um, first and foremost, in the 2022 Water Resources and Development Act, uh, which is currently under development inside U.S. Congress that uh, helps them direct funds to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for public works projects. And um, if we're not successful there, there are other opportunities for us to, uh, to potentially uh, get that funding to get that project moving. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, this is a, termed a mega project uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers because of its complexity and uh, largesse in terms of funds that are necessary to construct it. And so um, even while uh, a full federal appropriation could potentially come this year, full construction of the project might not occur until at least 2030. And so we can hope uh, that uh, efforts to keep the Asian carp out, such as overfishing inside the Mid Mid Mississippi River Basin, as well as existing deterrence, would hope keep, keep those uh, invasive uh, carps out of uh, the Great Lakes. 
I wanted to give you a little update on the uh, Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Compact and Agreement. And um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, this compact and agreement, it governs uh, water withdrawals, uh, consumptive uses, and diversions on the Great Lakes, as well as helps the, uh, the states um, develop uh, conservation and efficiency programs for water in each one of their jurisdictions. And um, this year, Pennsylvania is chairing uh, both of these uh, organizations. Um, and so they will be meeting here in Erie uh, in, um, in June. And uh, you would be able to participate in that meeting if you so choose on Thursday, June 16th. More information will be coming on that, but it is open to the public. You can hear uh, updates from each one of the jurisdictions, as well as some of the science uh, focus uh, that has been going on during this year on cumulative impact assessment. And so the compact and agreement have provisions every five years to, uh, to examine whether or not our water use is affecting the overall resource of the Great Lakes. And um, that, that effort is underway right now within each of the jurisdictions to help provide information to make that determination. So uh, more e meeting information can be found on www.glslcompactcouncil.org and www.glslregionalbody.org. And I will drop both of those links in the chat box um, or, or discussion area so that you can uh, directly go there. Uh, secondly, I wanted to cover the Great Lakes Water Quality and so this is the agreement uh, between the US and Canada and April 15th of this year marked the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. That's pretty neat. And this is between the US and Canada and, and this agreement was a landmark agreement. Uh, it has been effective in improving and protecting the water quality of the Great Lakes. And uh, it's achieved dramatic uh, reductions in toxic substances. Uh, you know, those substances that are in the environment that harm fish and wildlife. And, and some of those substances have been reduced by 90% or more. And so it's been very successful. Now, as you know, we still have challenges on the, on the Great Lakes, uh, specifically in Lake Erie when it comes to nutrients, um, nutrient runoff and contributions to the lake that cause harmful algorithms that we're gonna hear about. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But, uh, you know, all of the work that's been here, you know, including even uh, the delisting of Presque Isle Bay from the Great Lakes area is concerned. You know, all of this work has been done through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And, um, you know, it's a testament to the strength of that, uh, that agreement, as well as the, uh, the commitment of the states and provinces that are involved in that process. But, uh, you know, for more information on that, uh, you, you can, um, you can search on uh, uh, the, the website for EPA and um, the 50 year anniversary celebration will be held in Niagara Falls, Ontario, September 27th through 29th. And uh, this is going to coincide with, the, coincide with the Great Lakes Public Forum, which is an opportunity for anyone from the public to come and learn about uh, over three days, all of the excellent work that's going on. Secondly, uh, the Annex 4 subcommittee, which is commonly referred to as the Nutrients Annex of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, is currently assembling 2021 Lake Erie point and non-point source phosphorus discharge data so they can determine whether or not phosphorus loadings have gone up to Lake Erie, gone down, or stayed roughly the same over the previous water year. And we need to wait for a few months into the, the new year. We're in 2022 now, clearly. And um, that way it, it allows us to consolidate all the data from the previous water year and then get that submitted to the um, United States EPA and USGS so they can do all of that load tabulation. And so, um, you know, we'll look forward to seeing how our collective actions are impacted and we'll lake off of that. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover here today is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And uh, the, the president, uh, President Biden released his, um, his 2023 president's budget, which is a proposal to Congress on how uh, to uh, allocate funding over the, the next fiscal year. 
And, uh, and while the, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is funded right now at $330 million for 2020, FY 2022, it's uh, proposed to be increased to $340 million in the president's budget. And so we'll see how U.S. Congress um, works through that process and what the end number uh, is at the end of the day. Um, also, there were uh, infrastructure funds that were dedicated to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, uh, also referred to as the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. And uh, we're still waiting to hear more information as to um, and to how those, uh, those funds will be allocated uh, for GLRI activities, but we do know that the bulk of those funds will likely go to restoring those areas of concern throughout the Great Lakes that are that uh, currently are in the process of, of restoring and delisting. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Amber um, so she can introduce our first speaker on the topic of PFAS. Thanks, Tim. And if anyone has any questions for Tim, pop them in the Q&A, and he's going to plug in those websites so that you can get more information about that June 16th date. So with that, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker of the day, second speaker, because Tim was first, I apologize. Amy Williams is with the Pennsylvania Bureau of Clean Water. Amy graduated from Shippensburg University with an undergraduate degree in geoenvironmental studies and a master's degree in biology. She has been with DEP since 2007, working in the Bureau of Clean Water, Water Quality Division in the assessment section. The primary function of this section is producing the 303D and 305B integrated water quality report every two years. In addition, Amy has been in charge of organizing emerging contaminant sampling as part of the department's commitment to investigating new water quality issues. Amy, thank you for joining us today to talk about PFOS. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, let me share my screen here. Make sure this works. All right. Can you see the picture of the bird? Not yet. Okay. It's coming up. I see the bird. Okay, great. And let me get my presentation up. Okay. So at any time, if you can't hear me um, or you need something um, stopped or, you know, repeated, um, just let me know. Uh, Amber will let me know if, if we, I need any interruption, but uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, Pennsylvania's surface water PFAS sampling, um, which we've been involved in since 2019. Um, and I'll start with an overview of PFAS uh, in case folks aren't too familiar. This is a pretty basic overview. Um, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with, with what they are, but if not, um, PFAS are um, man-made chemicals. These are not found naturally in the environment. They tend to be persistent. They don't break down easily in both the environment and in the human body. There are thousands of different PFAS chemicals um, but only a small subset have really been tested for in the environment. Um, the tree you see here uh, is on the DEP website. It gives some examples of different PFAS groups. And some of the most well-known are the perfluoral alkyls, um, particularly the perfluoral octane sulfonic acid or PFAS and perfluoral octane octanoic acid PFOA. So these were produced in the US in the past. Um, PFAS have been used since the 1940s, so they're not new chemicals necessarily, um, but they've largely been phased out of production and replaced by other chemicals that are supposed to be de uh, degrade faster. Um, but the PFAS, like PCBs and other persistent chemicals uh, have been remaining in the environment. They're in many different things um, that you might, that you'll probably had used every day or have been in contact with. Firefighting foams um, is probably one of the most famous, uh, infamous uses. Uh, detergents, paints, 
food packaging, nonstick coatings, um, anything that resists stains, uh, water and grease, metal plating, um, formulating for pesticides and photography uses. So there are a lot of different things. There's many ways that people could be exposed to PFAS, uh, drinking water, um, different foods, paper products, dust, um, other consumer products, um, breast milk, it's been found in, in that. Um, food uh, is thought to be the primary source for exposure according to the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, but obviously they're in other products as well. So research has definitely been picking up on the harmful effects of PFOS. Um, a lot of the research suggests more research is needed, um, but we do know it's per they're persistent in the human body. Um, they could be associated with increases in blood cholesterol and high blood pressure. Um, apparently they are most closely associated with the organ, your liver can cause uh, liver damage and could cause problems with development and reproductive systems. So why study PFOS in surface water? So um, like I mentioned previously, they're persistent in the environment and they don't break down due, their, due to their chemical composition. Um, they have been detected in Pennsylvania public water systems. Uh, in 2013, the Third unregulated contaminant monitoring rule or UCMR, which is um, a program established by the EPA, required uh, PFO and PFOS testing um, from the, the states. Uh, and these, this, uh, this program, like the name suggests, uh, develops a policy to um, sample unregulated contaminants. So PFOS at that moment was unregulated completely. So in this study, um, 175 out of 3,000 public water systems were sampled in PA and some PFOS were detected. Um, since then, PFOS sampling has occurred regularly uh, at different public water systems with some PFOS detected. Um, as some folks might be familiar with, there are uh, drinking water mandates now for PFOS and Pennsylvania is developing some more um, areas of particular concern are where uh, aqueous film forming foam, the, uh, the, um, the firefighting foam, where that is being used, such as military bases and airports, industrial areas, landfills, and wastewater from wastewater treatment plants could contain PFAS. So I'm going to discuss the surface water sampling not the drinking water sampling that has been completed. Um, we followed with doing surface water sampling in 2019. So after that UCMR study started um, and the results, you might not be able to see this very well. I could come back and maybe enlarge it later. Um, on the DEP website, the public website under business, water, clean water, water quality and, and CECs. So that's contaminants of emerging concern the shorthand for that. Uh, in the middle of the page is a section called per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. There is a drinking water page for PFOS as well, so not to be confused with that. The data and results from the drinking water study is on the drinking water page. Um, the results from our surface water studies are accumulating here. And um, we worked in conjunction with USGS to conduct PFOS sampling in 2019 and that the data is located under the link USGS PFOS data 2019, that will redirect you to the USGS website containing the data release. And then a small summary of the sampling is located here where it says surface water PFOS summary 2019. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of the results um, from that summary. Um, we sampled, 178 spots with the highest concentrations of PFAS found in the southeastern part of the state um, at what we call water quality network stations. So these are stations that the uh, clean water program samples regularly for many different contaminants. 
And these stations were chosen for a variety of reasons to be sampled, not because they're PFAS locations, but um, as water quality stations throughout the entire state to get a representative <clears throat> distribution of water quality across the state. But coincidentally, um, the, uh, the Southeast ones did have the highest levels of PFAS. Um, so subsequent to that 2019 collection effort, additional data was collected in 2020 and 2021 um, to include more frequent water collection at fewer locations. And we also implemented some fish tissue data collection and analysis. <clears throat> so the surface water sampling started uh, at the 178 already established Pennsylvania water quality network stations and a single data collection event happened at each um, along with uh, quality assurance data. Um, so samples from these WQN stations were analyzed for 33 different PFAS chemicals and 19 total oxidizable precursors or TOP um, as of the abbreviation. So this TOP assay the total oxidizable precursor assay um, treats samples that um, could expose PFAS chemicals that are the transformation products from other chemicals. So it may, chemicals can transform into these various PFAS chemicals that wouldn't be um, quantified in that initial sample. So it basically takes these over time and uh, We'll, we'll find if there's another terminal PFAS chemical. So the, the concentration could either show then that there is a PFAS contamination of that chemical that wasn't there in the original sample. Um, samples were analyzed at SGS Access Analytical um, in British Columbia, Canada, um, using the two methods here, which were there um, proprietary methods, MLA 110 and MLA 111, which is different than the drinking water methods. Um, prior to data collection, the DEP, USGS, and uh, also the Susquehanna River Basin staff helped collect samples. Um, they conducted rigorous quality assurance to ensure that the equipment we're using and the protocols being used to collect the samples would not contaminate the sample, which happens can happen pretty frequently in PFAS sampling since PFAS are in so many items. Um, and it showed that uh, the sampling methodology should be very safe um, in not contaminating the sample. Um, and there were uh, numerous blanks collected as well as duplicate samples collected. Um, in addition to the surface water data collected, DEP staff deployed passive water samplers at 18 sites. So passive water samplers are uh, devices, uh, which I'll show on another slide, deployed in the water for a period of time. In this case, about 30 days. The samplers contain media that over time accumulate pollutants. Um, it provides an indication of how much of a specific pollutant may be present over a longer period of time. Um, passive samplers, they can help characterize low levels of pollutants that may not be detectable by discrete surface water samples. So we thought they might be useful in uh, combining with these grab samples. So um, this is the list of all the PFAS chemicals analyzed and the 19 uh, total oxidizable precursors. Um, the top analysis here is where the X's are. So these were all analyzed for the, the, top, the top assay. And these are all the compounds with their abbreviations that were analyzed in the samples. So obviously PFAS, PFOA, they're included here, along with some other significantly known PFAS chemicals. The um, the passive samplers, which we deployed, were called POSIS, Polar Organic Chemical Integrated Samplers. Um, uh, they were deployed at 18 sites. And they, uh, like I mentioned before, they're comprised of a 
uh, membrane with a solid, and they have a solid phase sorbent, and they, that samples hydrophilic contaminants, which of which PFAS uh, should should be sampled pretty pretty well with the, these. Um, we had them in the field for about a month, and then went back and collected them. And this is a photograph of one. So there's one holder that has three filters in it, and these filters accumulate the contaminants. Um, we've also used POSIS to sample for hormones, pharmaceuticals, and pesticides. So I'll be showing you some results. I'm not going into too much of the results from the POSIS samples, concentrating mainly on the grab samples, but these give you results just in a, uh, a raw value, uh, they say um, milligrams per POSIS or nanogram per POSIS. And you actually have to do a calculation if you would like to compare this result to a concentration. Um, these are calculated using the length of deployment time and something called the sampling rate that is a lab derived number. Um, these can be time consuming calculations. Um, they're not exact concentrations since of course they're out for a period of time, um, but it can give you a general idea of um, high level of contamination to low level of contamination and presence to absence. So we put these passive samplers out in the field. That's what they look like when they're in the bottom of the stream. We generally do try to cover them a bit with rocks um, or other items still allowing the water flow um, to go through and reducing sediment in the samplers. Because obviously with them showing up like this, vandalism could be quite common. And then we pick them up after about a month. And you can see on the right there, they can get pretty, pretty dirty. But if we put them out correctly um, and suspend them a bit over the, the substrate, they don't collect sediment and they, the water is allowed to flow through pretty, pretty well. So these are some of the results for the discrete or grab samples. Um, total PFAS was some was calculated in the, this particular graph um, or map by summing the detected concentrations of PFBS, P, PFOS, PFOA, PFHXA, PFNA, PFDA, and PFDOA um, that were in the grab samples. Um, and then in the POSIS samples. So these seven PFAS were used to calculate the total PFAS concentrations for this map because they are the seven chemicals for which the concentrations could be calculated in the POSIS samples, um, thus allowing for comparison between the grab samples and the POSIS samples. Um, so every PFAS, well, all 33 were not necessary, were not summed for this particular map. Um, details for this map are in that link that I had on the first slide, so I'll show, I can show that again then if we need to. Um, so one other thing to note about this map is that when the total oxidizable precursor was higher than the original PFOS result, the, that total oxidizable precursor value was used, so any detection was seen. Um, as I mentioned before, the highest concentrations were in the southeast corner of the state at the station at Neshaminy Creek, Valley Creek, and Wissahickon Creek. Um, and get to the next slide. Um, this map is, is the same sites, but shows the total number of detections uh, out of the 33 tested chemicals. Um, so interestingly, while the sites with the highest total PFOS and uh, PFOS and PFOA concentrations did have the highest number of chemicals detected. It's worth noting that um, many sites with very low level of detections could have a fairly high number of compounds detected, um, just you know, low concentrations. For example, uh, the Water Quality Network Station at Paxton Creek, which is around Harrisburg in the center of the state, um, had very low level detections, but a high number of compounds detected. So this pattern was also observed in the POSIS samples. Um, the highest number of PFOS detections were 10. 
um, in the grab samples occurring at the Chamonix Creek, Valley Creek, and Wissahickon Creek, and the highest number of detections in the POSIS samples actually occurred in uh, the Lehigh River and the Delaware River at Trenton. But again, those two were not necessarily high concentrations. So I know this forum is specifically focusing on Lake Erie. Um, so I pulled out a little screenshot of the Lake Erie PFAS monitoring. These are the sites around Lake Erie that we sampled in 2019. As you can see, looking at the legend there, the concentrations were pretty low. So after that initial set, which were a lot of different, a lot of stations throughout the state, um, in conjunction with USGS, we took 12 water quality network stations. That's the ones listed there. And um, Lake Erie and its tributaries were not part of that. Um, because they had low concentrations of PFAS. So that was good news, actually. Um, these stations were targeted for additional monthly PFAS um, sampling in 2020. So monthly data collection occurred here, which um, was anticipated to provide a more robust PFAS characterization at these locations um, and possibly to create the opportunity to monitor trends of PFAS chemicals in surface water over time. These results are not graphed like this on our website. Um, however, they were analyzed at DEP Bureau of Labs. So um, they are on our website under the uh, mapping application, uh, EMAP PA. If you go to the chemical sampling section, water, uh, water monitoring section. So this here um, summed all the detected PFOS compounds. Um, in the sample, which were uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight compounds um, in this map here. And you can see we had high levels, highest levels out in the southeast, and also um, a high spike out in the west, which is actually Mahoning River. So in 2022, we've started um, collecting at these 16 stations. Uh, so again, we looked at our data, looked at sites of concern, and um, started sampling at these. Uh, I don't have results from these yet, but this is just what's up and coming. So do you have any questions? I know it's kind of rapid fire. And that was great. Thank you so much, Amy. Sure. Thank you very much, Amy. And, you know, this has been a topic that's been slowly um, gathering uh, interest as well as uh, concern across the Great Lakes uh, landscape. And, um, you know, as you know, in a lot of cases, when we start, when we talk about regulation of toxics and our ability to address them through, um, through, through regulation, it, it requires, uh, you know, this regulatory process that, that begins on the federal level in most cases. And uh, in this one, um, in the, with regards to PFOS, PFOS uh, you know, it's really been uh, something that's been led by the states. And, um, you know, that might be a good segue uh, and, and then what we could do, like we could turn it over to our next speaker, uh, who's who has some remarks regarding drinking water regulation for PFOS here in uh, Pennsylvania, and then we can uh, combine the questions uh, from the entire group. Sure, I can stop sharing here. I know Brian said he didn't have any slides, but just in case. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, I did have one question before before we turn it over to, to Brian. Is that, uh, you know, there's been more studies uh, taking ground uh, taking place on the ground um, uh, across the Great Lakes and tributaries, identifying how um, 
the sediment loads of those tributaries are contributing to the open water concentrations of PFAS. So you would have contamination on, uh, you know, sites inside of a watershed that, um, you know, through non-point source uh, activity uh, would eventually make their way uh, down into the open water. Is that is that what you're seeing also, or at least suspecting inside of uh, some of those high concentration, high hit areas in Pennsylvania? Uh, yes, possibly. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that because we are uh, writing up a paper with USGS that will go into some of the findings of the 2019 study in more detail. So you can keep an eye out for that, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, and we were discussing, uh, talking about loading in that. Excellent. And Amber, did you want to introduce our next person? Oh, no, I think I was supposed to do that, right? No. <laughs> no, you're good. I was just waiting for more questions. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. We will uh, we'll move on to Brian, and then we'll take additional PFOS questions then. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce Brian Chalfont with the Pennsylvania DEP as the Deputy D Policy Director for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, Brian spends a lot more time in Harrisburg than on Lake Erie. But when he was 11 years old, Brian did once get seasick while fishing for walleye on Lake Erie. So Brian, thank you for being here today to talk to us about PFOS regulation. Thanks, Amber. And yeah, thanks for uh, making the Erie connection. Um, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Brian Chalfont. Um, as Amber said, the Deputy Policy Director with DEP. Um, and I just wanted to give today a quick overview, um, as Tim mentioned with that great segue, um, about a rulemaking that um, Pennsylvania is undertaking regarding PFOS in drinking water. Um, so as Tim mentioned, um, most drinking water standards uh, in the US, especially in Pennsylvania, all of the drinking water standards so far that have been adopted in Pennsylvania um, were developed at the federal level um, and then adopted by Pennsylvania after being developed at the federal level. So this, this rulemaking to um, you know, set contaminant limits, set limits essentially in drinking water for PFAS um, in Pennsylvania is it's a very unique rulemaking in that you know it's you know unprecedented that um, Pennsylvania is setting its own you know develop, developing its own um, drinking water standards for these chemicals um, in Pennsylvania rather than adopting standards that have been developed at the federal level. Um, so I'm going to drop a link in the chat here that to a web page that has some other information about where you can find um, more details about the rulemaking. Um, and today, I'm just gonna give a little overview of kind of the, the, the overview of the rulemaking, kind of where it is in the process, um, not so much getting into the, the nuts and bolts of the details of the rulemaking, um, but maybe we'll try to share my screen here and just show this web page. Uh, so is that coming through? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, if you go to this web page, this um, this web page has a lot of information about um, various actions that um, DEP and other state agencies have taken to address PFAS and are continuing to take to address PFAS. Um, so you can kind of scroll through here and find you know look look at whatever you know piques your interest. Um, but what I want to highlight today, if you go to this DEP involvement tab on this web page, and you click on that, um, and then scroll down close to the bottom of the page, you can see here it highlights um, different things that uh, DEP programs, you know, safe drinking water, clean water, have been doing, which Amy touched on that you know the monitoring of PFAS in surface waters that um, Amy presented um, is part of you know, the, the overall kind of DEP effort to address PFAS. Um, but you can see things that different DEP programs are doing to address PFAS. And the details about this rulemaking that uh, I'm gonna talk about here are near the bottom of the page in this proposed rulemaking to set MCLs for 
uh, two of the chemicals that uh, Amy talked about, PFOA and PFOS in drinking water. Um, and those standards are referred to as MCLs, which stands for uh, maximum contaminant limit. So, you know, kind of it's the amount that is the maximum amount that would be allowable in drinking water if this rulemaking is finalized. Um, so, you know, there's various links here, these documents that you can get into the details of um, what's being proposed and why it's being proposed. Um, but I just kind of, like I mentioned, I'll just give an overview of how this kind of came about and where we are in the process. Um, so a lot of this started um, with um, Governor Wolf signed an executive order in September of 2018 uh, to form an uh, interagency uh, PFOS action team um, to address you know PFOS in Pennsylvania, which you know I think Amy touched on at the beginning of her talk that. Um, you know, PFOS are in a, a variety of um, consumer products and, uh, you know, firefighting foams. There was a question in the chat about firefighting foams, and Amy talked about that too. Um, so, you know, it, because these chemicals are so ubiquitous, um, it takes kind of a, you know, all of DEP approach to address them. But even beyond just DEP, you know, there's other agents, other state agencies that have um, you know, things they can do to help address the concerns about these chemicals um, in Pennsylvania. So that executive order kind of provided a, a structure, a framework for an action team to, um, you know, coordinate those efforts. Um, and this, this particular rulemaking with this, um, you know, the drinking water side of it um, is part of that effort. Um, and as I mentioned, this is you know, the first time that Pennsylvania has developed a, a drinking water standard, an MCL, um, rather than adopting something that was developed, an MCL that was developed at the federal level. And I'll, I'll just note here that, um, so yeah, this rulemaking is currently open for pub public comment, um, which you can, uh, there's a variety of ways you can um, go about commenting on this. Um, I'll put a link, another link in the chat here to DEP's e-comment system, which is probably the easiest way to, um, if you have you know, comments you want to provide on this rulemaking, um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, there's also, if you, if, on this web page that I have up here, if you go and click on this EQB web page link, there's other, um, other ways that you can provide comments. So if you wanna do that by like email or if you wanna mail in comments. Um, so the comment period is open through April 27th. Um, so another, what is that, couple weeks um, here. And from there, after the public comment period closes, we'll be um, you know, reading all the comments as they come in um, and making um, adjustments to the rulemaking based on those comments, and then it will be developing what's called a draft final form rulemaking to um, move forward in the, the regulatory process with that. Um, and we're anticipating that, um, so yeah, the comment period will close the end of this month, um, and then from there we'll be responding to the comments, developing a draft final rulemaking which will be taken to um, DEP's Drinking Water Advisory Board, probably um, middle, late, middle, late part of this summer. Um, and then it'll go through the rest of the rulemaking process and the Environmental Quality Board um, and some other things. Um, but that's um, what I wanted to cover today, kind of an overview of what that rulemaking is, how it came about um, and where we are um, in the process with it. Thanks, Brian. And, and, you know, could you just talk a little bit about why states generally don't wake, make their own drinking water standards? I think this is an interesting point because of how involved that process is. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes, a lot of that comes down to like the, you know, developing drinking water standards, you need like toxicological expertise to do that in a lot of cases. And you know, EPA has, EPA has got a whole office of research and development that has, you know, many toxicologists on staff um, and, you know, they've got a, some pretty robust research and, you know, toxicological research capabilities, um, which, 
you know, the traditional model has been like, you know, that's why the feds do that part. And then the states, you know, kind of rely on the federal US EPA capacity to do that, um, which in this case with this rulemaking, you know, we felt that we needed to do something to pre protect Pennsylvanians from these chemicals. And in the absence of, you know, the feds are now taking, they've indicated that they're going to be taking action, but we felt we needed to move forward with this to protect Pennsylvanians until that happens. So part of the part of developing that was we had to, you know, we don't have toxicologists on staff at DEP because we usually rely on the feds to do that. Um, so we had to contract uh, with Drexel University to do, you know, for that toxicological um, kind of consulting piece of it. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and, you know, can you talk a little bit also about um, how we coordinated with other states that were looking at the issue in the same lens as Pennsylvania uh, in terms of, you know, generally we don't have the, the either enough or the correct resources to do this type of rulemaking. Um, how do you ramp that up uh, in terms of interstate conversations so that you could do cooperative measures? Yeah, so that was definitely part of developing this rulemaking was looking at what other states were doing and that's something that Drexel looked at too as part of that contract was looking at okay how did other states come up with their drinking water standards that they've either proposed or adopted um, and yeah there were a lot of other conversations that our drinking water folks are involved with um, you know some national organizations of like all the drinking water um, you know the drinking water parts of the you know, DEP counterparts in other states to see like, okay, how did you guys approach this? Um, and so, yeah, that was a lot of what went into the development of this rulemaking. And if you look, we have in the, I think it's in the preamble of the rulemaking that shows like where the standards that Pennsylvania is now proposing fall in relation to some other states that have proposed or adopted standards. And there were, I mean, there's a little bit of variation, but we're all pretty much in the same ballpark. I mean, we're talking about you know, kind of nanograms per liter here, which is like, I forget the analogy I've heard. It's like a, you know, half, half of a salt grain and like a Olympic sized swimming pool kind of concentration. So, you know, very low concentrations and the other states that have proposed or adopted these standards, the, the standards that we're proposing now are pretty well in the same, same kind of range as where other states have landed on this. Great, Amy, are you still with us? Yep, still with you. I just needed to <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> Amber, I think we'll turn it over to some of these questions that, that have uh, been entered into the question and answer box. Absolutely. So the first question is from Issy, and she's wondering, do you put those filter tools in the ground? You kind of went over this in your presentation, but do you mind just touching, I guess, on how they're attached? Um, sure, yeah. So, um, there's a, many different methods to attach these. And if you look at the, the literature out there, um, usually we will take a stake, like a pound of stake into the ground, um, attach carabiners to it. And then, so it's a, above the substrate um, a bit, you know, like a foot or however deep the water is, you wanna be able to, you wanna make sure these are submerged at all times. So you wanna um, put them out at, you know, probably a lower flow level. Um, so that's only gonna go up from there. Um, and then we attach carabiners to them and usually I put like an emergency cable on them so that in case the first carabiner comes undone, it's connected to another one that we connect all of the, those canisters together. Um, and so that's what we do. And then you put, um, we'll put like supporting rocks around them and stuff and try to kind of hide them a little bit but allowing the water to flow through. If, if it's in a very deep area, we've put these out in the Susquehanna River and Juniata River, places like that. Um, we will sometimes stake them or tie them to a rock and then just kind of hang them from in the water column closest to the bottom. They can also be used for uh, sample, they can also be put in lakes that way. Um, and they've been used to sample groundwater, although, I'm not too familiar with that process. That's great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Jean. 
Are these, are your, I'm assuming she's talking about your PFOS results. Are these from non-point sources? Yes, I would assume. Um, we haven't really found a point source per se for any of the levels. Um, I mean, in the Southeast corner of the state, um, there's the Department of Defense sites that are known to um, have the firefighting foam usage. So, but that's not exactly a point source. Um, so I would say probably most of these are non-point sources. We haven't really sampled at discharge sites for this contamination. Sure, thank you. Okay. Um... There is another question in here related to DOD sites. Uh, extensive use on military bases and ships and aircraft carriers and at airfields. Um, but the, I think the question is, have they started using less harmful surfactants or chemicals? Yeah, see, most of these chemicals have been phased out of usage, but they're just so persistent that they remain in the area of their previous use. Thank you so much. That's, that's a great way to put that. Um, Amber, I see another question here from Rose Kerr, and this, this touches on something that uh, was brought up at uh, previous meetings that I was attending in the Great Lakes. And, and that's how these, how these chemicals get uh, distributed, you know, the modes of transport and introduction into the environment. Um, and, and so Rose's question is uh, regarding food exposure. And uh, in relation to PFOS, and you know it, whether or not if the slide that had that in in your presentation, whether the exposure was the greatest risk or the common exposure uh, exposure method. Right. So um, I mean, obviously, PFOS chemicals are in lots and lots of items. So I saw. I mean, just incidentally, I remember seeing an article recently in the news about it being in food packaging. That's actually been known that it was in food packaging. Um, you know, it's that's one reason why we did such extensive um, sampling to make sure we weren't going to contaminate the samples during collection because, you know, it could be in or on any number of products that you come in contact to every day. So um, it's kind of ubiquitous in a lot of different things. But um, I had mentioned about food being anticipated to be the key source of exposure, probably not necessarily the greatest risk. This is what the PA Department of Health suggests. So um, they have a fact sheet on that site that Brian directed everyone to on the drinking water site that might um, be informative for some folks to read how more detail about how people are exposed to PFAS. So uh, one of the things that was interesting that I, I had heard was um, was atmospheric deposition of PFAS is, is something of concern, um, especially in those places, uh, I guess, out west of here, um, where there may be either uh, surface contamination uh, at sites where um, where dust is then lifted up into the atmosphere and then deposited in, in, in other places that are downwind of there. What do you know about uh, the atmospheric component of, of PFAS? Honestly, I'm, I'm probably not the best person individually to answer that question because I'm, we haven't really tested, sampled, or considered that, but I'm sure it could be a source given that it's in, like you mentioned, dust and it can be um, lifted into the air, but I'm afraid I don't have any answers right at this moment about that. <laughs> sure, and that's maybe something we can follow up on with um, with another expert in, in future in future uh, forum meetings. Amber, are you seeing any other questions in the chat or the Q and A? I am not. Brian did add a link to DEP's e-comment tool to the chat. So make sure you check that out. And if you do have additional questions for Amy or Brian, please feel free to um, add them into the Q&A or the chat and we will certainly get to them. Oh wait, 
We have one. Okay. Uh, Thomas would like to know, um, are, are these the same substances that Tupperware and similar containers emit when they are microwaved? So I know they're used in, they were, were used in the production of nonstick cookware when they're microwaved. I'm actually not sure if they're emitted. <laughs> That's okay, and that's interesting that they were um, components of nonstick cookware. They're not currently though, right? No, and um, I'm trying to remember what we discussed about nonstick cookware, if they're in the nonstick cookware or if they were used in the production of it. Um, I can, can I jump in here, Amy? Yeah, yeah they, you, you it, were talking it's... about you were talking about that previously. That's why I was kind of hoping you might jump in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. It is the second one. They're used uh, it, as a surfactant in the the production of of the cookware, and it was in the production of not not Tupperware but Teflon. And uh, some of the longer ones have been phased out, and they've been replaced with uh, shorter chain ones, which are less toxic but not non toxic. But it it is the danger in in the cookware is primarily to the people who are producing it because they're they're dealing with the raw material. Once the stuff has actually been polymerized, it is whatever is in there is just trapped inside the plastic for you know as long as the plastic exists. So unless you're like grinding up your uh, Teflon and eating it, I I'm not terribly concerned about that. But um, you know there is always ways for it to to get out if you you know throw it in an incinerator or whatever. You have to be worried about that. But as far as PFAS and in plastics, I consider that a low risk, but um, opinions may differ. Great, thank you for jumping in, Matt. Okay, I don't see any other questions popping in the chat or in the Q&A box, but again, feel free to uh, add them um, as we go through. Uh, we're gonna take a quick five minute break. So it's 2.01 now, uh, so get up, Take a stretch, walk around a little bit, and then join us back here at 2.06 for the second half of our webinar. Okay, we are recording again. So we will uh, move on to the next segment. Unless Tim, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to the PFOS discussion? No, other than there was just a question from uh, from one of our participants, and uh, Jean, we I dropped a link there for uh, how these chemicals can be disposed. I think that's the most recent guidance from United States Environmental Protection Agency on uh, on how to do this. And basically, I think it consists of, of three separate areas: either disposing of them in landfills. Um, injecting them in underground uh, in, in injection wells uh, to forever be encased <laughs> by geology, or um, in some cases, uh, incineration. And I know Pennsylvania responded to that guidance with its own letter, but, um, uh, but that's uh, easily uh, searchable on, on Google if you'd like to, to check that out. Great, thank you so much for including that information, Tim. And thank you, Amy and Brian for, and Matthew for uh, your very invigorating conversation about PFOS. So we are going to bring it a little closer to home and talk specifically about Erie County. We are joined today by Jenny Tompkins, the new campaign manager for clean water advocacy in the Lake Erie watershed for Penn Future. She leads the Our Water, Our Future campaign focused on sound policy solutions, collaborative efforts to promote water quality and ensure the health of local communities. Prior to joining Penn Future, Jenny served as the Crawford County Assistant Planning Director of Community Development. She earned a bachelor's degree from Allegheny College majoring in environmental studies. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today to provide a few updates on the common agenda. Amber, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to give some updates. I'm just gonna share my screen if you wouldn't mind confirming that you can see the presentation. Yes. Looks good. Cool. 
All right. So as Amber mentioned, I recently joined Penn Future as a campaign manager for clean water advocacy. I'm going to focus today on some updates on some work that Penn Future had started prior to my arrival and mention some opportunities to implement some of the recommendations that we have for the Lake Erie watershed. So I'm going to also give an overview of Penn Future as an organization, just so that in case folks don't have an understanding, I will start there. Our organization is actually known as Citizens for Pennsylvania's Future. We were founded in 1998 and we are a 501c3 nonprofit environmental advocacy organization. We operate with over 30 staff in five offices, including Erie, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Mount Pocono, and Philadelphia. I am our only Lake Erie area, uh, Erie County employee. We work across four different departments internally. In addition to our executive staff, that includes a legal and policy team made up of lawyers and policy analysts that litigate often against polluters and provide expertise on policy making at the state level. We have a paid lobbyist, one of three paid environmental full-time lobbyists at the state level that leads our legislative affairs team in Harrisburg. I am on the campaigns team. There are half a dozen of us that lead coalitions or uh, collaborative efforts with existing environmental organizations at a regional or watershed level, in my case, the Pennsylvania Lake Erie watershed. And lastly, we have a civic engagement team that does voter education and engagement efforts, primarily in communities of color that have been historically left out of democratic processes. And I just wanted to mention that in 2017, we also formed a strategic partnership with Conservation Voters of PA, which is a 501c4 sister environmental advocacy organization. Because they're a C4, they can do more lobbying and can provide endorsements of specific candidates or assessments of elected officials that we can't do. So we work in, in tandem across a whole ladder of engagement with the public. I also wanted to give a little bit of an overview on our campaign for Erie, which I lead the Our Water, Our Future campaign. I'm thankful for my predecessor and the community organizations that contributed to laying this foundation. Uh, Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed was published in late 2020 and offers a comprehensive plan for better protecting water quality in, our, in the Lake Erie watershed. It has over 50 policy-based budgetary and collaborative recommendations at the municipal, county, state, and federal level. And we had signatory approval from 12 community and environmental organizations that I actually featured here on this slide, as well as scientific review from faculty and scientists at a number of regional institutions and a social justice reviewing team from a number of organizations that represent communities of color and disadvantaged communities in the Erie region. So I'll give everyone a, a second to absorb all of the folks who contributed to the common agenda. I'm thankful for their expertise and input. With the common agenda, we identified indirect and direct ongoing threats to water quality for Lake Erie and uh, the tributaries and other groundwater resources in the watershed. The common agenda is divided into nine parts that each address a threat and then outline a number of those recommendations that I mentioned at all levels of government and across institutions and businesses. The ninth section is actually focused at the federal level, which is a small part of the work that we do in the Lake Erie watershed, so I did not include it here on the slide. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about each of these threats and their impacts to water quality, but I do encourage you to review the rest of the common agenda, and I know that there are a lot of other prior LEAF meetings and presentations in the region that focused on the actual impacts and uh, water quality uh, uh, mitigation efforts on each of these. Instead, I'm going to talk about the opportunities that were afforded particularly as we face a lot of stimulus money from the American Rescue Plan Act and Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Acts and the local and state level funding afforded by those, recent regulatory decisions at the state level and shifts in elected official priorities or recent announcements dedicated to the environment or water quality. So I'm gonna go through this presentation and explain in some detail what funding might be available to support the recommendations in the common agenda, some recent and discussions, and then as I mentioned earlier, some updates on some work that we had started prior to my arrival. 
and those will relate to combating racism and environmental injustice, water pollution and flooding due to surface runoff, climate change and extreme weather, plastic and fossil fuel pollution, and legacy pollution, which is connected to the topic today of PFAS a little bit. So I'll start with some of the opportunities that exist under racism and environmental justice. There are three that I wanted to mention. Penn Future and our Common Agenda partners recognize environmental degrade, degradation disproportionately impacts people of color and communities facing persistent poverty. We call for recognition that marginalized groups be fairly represented at decision-making tables and equitably engaged in development and decision-making processes, including planning. For that reason, we recommend the creation of an Erie Environmental Advisory Council to offer expertise on a range of environmental issues and to engage with environmental justice communities at a full government level when new decisions are being made. Related to development decisions and environmental justice communities, I did want to mention as well that Penn Future and the Erie chapter of the NAACP remain in active litigation regarding the proposed expansion of the Bayfront uh, Parkway Central Corridor expansion. Based on a failure by PennDOT and the Federal Highway Administration to complete a full environmental assessment, therefore fully considering the environmental impacts on air, water, and human health, Earth Justice, representing Penn Future and NAACP, filed a suit to require a more extensive environmental review. Um, what I can say about this active litigation is that all documents have been submitted to the federal judge in Erie, and there's no deadline for a ruling, but we are hoping for one in the next several months on this case. And lastly, I just wanted to mention at the state level, there is legislation proposed in both the Senate and House to solidify environmental justice commitments at the state level. I won't go into too much detail here, but the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, has an Office of Environmental Justice and a supporting Environmental Justice Advisory Board made up of uh, residents from across the Commonwealth. This office currently exists due to an executive order issued by Governor Wolf that could be nullified or removed if there's a new governor. We know Governor Wolf is not running again, so we will have a new governor. The Office of Environmental Justice also recently revised and expanded its public participation process and policy, which are up for public comment. So we support this legislation to codify and solidify the Office of Environmental Justice and support ongoing efforts by the office to improve communication with disadvantaged communities. I also wanted to then move on to some of the opportunities we have to mitigate surface runoff, which was identified as the greatest direct threat to Lake Erie water quality in our common agenda and uh, agreed upon by our signatory partners. Currently, the city of Erie is considering a stormwater fee program that would equitably collect fees for all landowners based on the amount of impervious or developed surface that's found on their property. These fees would be collected and then deposited into a fund for stormwater management. We support this fee program and the passage of an ordinance that creates it and a credit policy that would allow property owners to implement best management practices that mimic nature and reduce their assessed fee. Similarly, we support the review and revision of other policies, including zoning ordinances and official municipal maps that protect open space and reduce impervious surface. Mill Creek Township is a good example of a, a municipality right now that's engaged in this discussion as it relates to their zoning ordinance and changes to be made. So we continue to support that, those ongoing changes both in the city of Erie and Mill Creek. And at the state level, there is an opportunity for an allocation of funding for clean water and the environment out of the state of Pennsylvania's $7 billion that they received from the American Rescue Plan Act. Penn Future is a member of what's called the Growing Greener Coalition, which is requesting $500 million out of that state American Rescue Plan Act allocation for investments in a Growing Greener 3 fund. There are companion bills that are getting bipartisan support in the Senate and House for that $500 million fund. Conservation of watershed projects over the past two decades of Pennsylvania have been largely funded as pass-throughs from several government bureaus, including DEP, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture through existing growing greener funds. So a lot of the local park projects, watershed improvement projects, and agricultural best management practices that help farmers keep their waterways clean 
that uh, border their farms have all been tied to growing greener funds in the past. A similar bill would also take $250 million out of the, the large $7 billion allocation at the state from the American Rescue Plan Act and create a clean streams fund, which would be Pennsylvania's first program dedicated solely to water protection and improvements. And new programs would be created to provide funding for municipal stormwater assistance and more agricultural best management practice programs. So all of that is to say that the American Rescue Plan Act and a portion of the funds that the state received could be utilized for conservation and clean water projects. And the common agenda directly called for a clean streams fund as it's called now, but a, a fund dedicated solely to water protection. So thank you. There are also opportunities coming our way to tackle some of the challenges associated with climate change and extreme weather for the Lake Erie watershed. I'll start with transportation, which accounts for about one third of greenhouse gas emissions in Pennsylvania and is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions across the US. As a region, Erie is largely dependent on cars for transportation and we are very much uh, identified by the highways that connect in Erie County. So there are a couple of items that I wanted to mention that present opportunities for implementing recommendations from the common agenda. Recently, the City of Erie Planning Commission expressed a commitment to implement a complete streets policy this year. This is also included in the long-term transportation planning document called the Long Range Transportation Plan at the county level. Complete streets ordinances consider all users of roadways, including pedestrians, cyclists, uh, vehicle drivers, et cetera, and public transit users, and really take into consideration the ability the opportunities to lower emissions, to increase aesthetic value, to plant green stormwater infrastructure and native plants and trees, and take safety very seriously. So we continue to advocate for the implementation of policies like this, Complete Streets, particularly at the city level, and hope to follow that discussion. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which I'll just keep mentioning because it provides a lot of opportunities around climate and the environment, sets aside $20 billion for clean transportation and $65 billion for grid improvements and renewable energy infrastructure. Penn Future and the Common Agenda Partners will continue to monitor these programs and advocate for the Erie region to get fair share funding for electrical ve vehicle chargers, grid improvements to support electrification and low emission public transit options, and the Biden administration has recently released guidance that shows not just competitive funding that will be available to states, but there will, there will be grant funded programs specifically for school districts, uh, local municipalities, counties, planning organizations. So there are opportunities at all levels of government. And lastly, I wanted to briefly mention that Penn Future continues to advocate for Pennsylvania's decision to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that puts a cap on the carbon pollution power plants can create and requires them to pay based on how much they pollute. Electricity generation counts for almost another third of statewide greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a priority outlined in Governor Wolf's 2021 Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan. We believe that revenue raised from the proceeds of REGI could be used to support the construction of more renewable energy infrastructure, could help workers transition from fossil fuels to clean energy jobs, and can provide funding to environmental and environmental justice and disadvantaged communities disproportionately harmed by fossil fuel reliance. So we support Pennsylvania's inclusion in REGI and the passage of legislation to help dictate how REGI revenue can be spent to support a transition to clean energy. On the next category, I wanted to focus on two relevant opportunities related to plastics and fossil fuel pollution, though these two focus on fossil fuel pollution. Uh, the Infrastructure Act, I'll just shorten it to that, also uh, provides funding for plugging orphan oil and gas wells, including $100 million for Pennsylvania, which is second in funding allocated only to Texas. Uh, abandoned and orphan oil and gas wells are sources of methane and volatile organic, uh, organic compounds that leak and contribute to climate change and can be toxic to human health. Erie County is home to over 135 orphan and abandoned wells, and we want to help ensure that funding is received in the, in the Lake Erie watershed for plugging out of the $100 million that's been allocated. I also wanted to mention 
uh, our uh, recommendation in the common agenda to make the spreading of conventional oil and gas brine uh, completely illegal on dirt and gravel roads in Pennsylvania. There was a 2018 moratorium on this application, but due to uh, what's often considered a loophole and some lack of capacity for reporting, dirt and gravel roads in 13 municipalities in the Lake Erie watershed saw the application of conventional oil and gas brine in the last three years. Recent studies from Penn State have shown that brine Brine application does not sufficiently suppress dust, as has been told to many local communities, and that reports provided by those companies that did attempt to utilize this, this gap in the moratorium have not sufficiently tested for a lot of radioactive and toxic materials before spreading brine. So we seek to increase awareness of this issue and uh, highlight additional studies and research that comes out about the impact of brine spreading and the amount of brine spread despite the moratorium. The last category I wanted to talk about for opportunities relates to legacy pollution. I'm going to mention the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act only one more time. It provides $5 billion to clean up contaminated sites known as brownfield and superfund sites. American Rescue Plan Act funds at the local level can also be used to support these efforts in what are called qualified census tracts where uh, there's a high concentration of poverty and other uh, injustice and inequity. Erie County has brownfield reclamation sites that were set aside in its budgeting for its American Rescue Plan Act funds, including the Quinty Piper site that I included a photo of here in the city of Erie. So there will continue to be additional opportunities for brownfield reclamation or the cleanup of these sites and likely the opportunity to combine competitive funding streams under stimulus money uh, to expand the impact of those efforts. And then the last thing I wanted to mention in terms of opportunities, the common agenda calls for PFAS MCL drinking water standards. So we are thankful for DEP's decision to engage in this rulemaking and set maximum contamination levels for drinking water for PFOA and PFOS or PFOA or PFOS and particularly because the, the proposed rulemaking sets those water quality standards to be much stricter than the, the, the current EPA recommendations. Penn Future is also a member of the Pennsylvania PFOS Coalition, so we continue to support efforts for additional testing across the Commonwealth and for resources for private water supplies, which are not covered under a drinking water rulemaking. We hope to continue to follow the Biden administration's intentions around PFOS and what it calls its roadmap for research identification and cleanup of sites, and to continue to assess through a lot of the research that's been described here if there are opportunities in the Pennsylvania Lake Erie watershed for the, the application of those funds. So I know that was a lot to cover in a brief amount of time, but I will say that we're in a unique position with the passage of the the American Rescue Plan Act and the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to have a lot of funding to support a lot of the efforts that were recommended in the common agenda. There are also some key regulatory actions being taken at the state level, like the PFAS uh, MCL drinking water quality standards that we mentioned, and shifting priorities for local elected officials that present opportunities for advocacy. So we're always looking for new partners that come uh, in our efforts to implement the common agenda and protect Lake Erie water quality. So please reach out to me if you have questions or, or want to know more information about the threats that we identified or the recommendations. And I thank you again for the time to give a bit of an overview. I have my contact information here and feel free to visit penfuture.org slash Erie to access the common agenda. Thank you so much, Jenny. There is a question in the chat for you and I will uh, encourage people to put questions in the Q&A or the chat as we answer this first one because I'm sure like there, that was a lot of information. I'm sure there are so many questions. Um, Michelle Woodhouse would like to know where is the section that specifically focuses on agriculture? So we don't have, of the eight sections that I mentioned, there is not one specifically uh, dedicated solely to agricultural issues, but the surface runoff category that deals with uh, water pollution and flooding due to surface runoff would be, would be the, the most relevant in that case. 
I would say, Michelle, if you do have specific questions about advocacy related to the agricultural sector, I'd be happy to, to follow up as well. Great, thank you. And I have a quick question. Um, I'm interested in learning a little bit more about the um, the surface water fee or the surface runoff fee and whether or not they're including mowed lawns as an impervious surface or as a permeable surface. Everything that I know about the city's current recommendation and the work that they've done with their consulting firm is that mowed lawns would be considered in the pervious category. So it would not be considered in the in the developed space that's assessed for a fee. Okay. Just interesting. Yeah, I uh, there, there's a lot to come in terms of updates from the city on their whole stormwater fee process. Tim, other questions? Yeah, Jenny, thank you very much. And that is a wide array of, uh, of project initiatives for just one person inside of uh, the Lake Erie Basin. Um, you know, what I did was, is I dropped a link to our, our presentation for the LEAF meeting that we did last July. And I thought it was a, it was a great segment on uh, environmental justice. And um, a quick snapshot of it, not only here in Pennsylvania, but um, how environmental justice initiatives uh, have impacted people uh, across the Great Lakes. So I encourage everybody to, to check that out on YouTube. Um, one of the questions I had was around the, uh, the Erie Environmental Advisory Council. And uh, was, did you have, uh, can you give us more information on how Penn Future would envision something like that uh, transpiring? Sure, I think I can, ho hopefully I'll answer the, the question as you framed it. If we need a follow-up, let me know, Tim. Um, Environmental advisory councils are allowable in Pennsylvania to be created at the municipal level via ordinance. And they commonly have seven representatives that are voting members and as many advisory members as needed. And they focus on a whole range of environmental issues. So the hope in the city of Erie would be that there would be an ordinance developed that would solidify and provide legislation for the creation of a body like this. And then it would pull from a lot of the expertise that we have in the region, professional and advocacy and citizen based that could speak to a whole slew of issues. They're invested in stormwater and other cities and municipalities in native tree planting and canopy cover and tree management, though luckily the city already has a committee dedicated to, to urban forestry, to policy making, to climate action planning, to uh, sustainable business initiatives and serving as a liaison. They do a lot of environmental education. So the hope would be that through an ordinance, a body like this would be created and then there'd be a work plan created for what the priorities would be at the city level. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question, Tim? Yeah, it sure did. And, um, you know, you had mentioned the DEP Office of Environmental Justice and uh, they that office has really been trying to implement some of the um, the higher level guidance, uh, you know, across the state, as well as increasing dialogue and input on DEP's permitting processes or policy processes. Um, you know, that being said, I, it, the federal government and the, and the state government are both committed to increasing um, feedback involvement, um, both from an equity standpoint and an inclusion standpoint. And, and so, um, you know, as, as we move forward over the coming months, as you see infrastructure funding come out, other sources of federal funding come out, these are gonna be important components of that funding. Um, so I'm looking forward to see, uh, you know, how Penn Future participates in, in those efforts. And do we have any other questions, Amber? I don't see any, but continue to pop them in there. And Jenny, if you see any pop up that pertain to you, please feel free to answer them directly. And with that, we will move on to our next presenter talking a little 
closer to home, even closer than, than Jenny, who's talking about Erie County, uh, but talking about uh, harmful algal blooms, we have Chelsea Erickson from the environmental, I am so sorry, Chelsea. <laughs> Uh, Chelsea is joining us from the Erie County Department of Health as an environmental protection specialist. Chelsea joined the department in 2008, and since 2013, she has been involved in various water quality programs. She is currently the Beach Act contact for the Lake Erie Beaches for the state of Pennsylvania under EPA Beaches Act. She also sits as a member of the uh, Lake Erie Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force in Erie County, and she is a guest to the Pennsylvania HAB Task Force. Chelsea also conducts public drinking water supply inspections on transient public water systems. She is a graduate from Edinburgh University with a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in environmental studies. So Chelsea, with summer right around the corner, thank you so much for joining us to talk about harmful algal blooms. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Amber. Everybody can hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. All right, I'm going to share my presentation. Um, like Amber said, Summer is just around the corner and we wanna give a brief overview of HABs. I could spend all day talking about HABs, but unfortunately we only have about 15 minutes. So this is gonna be how we're gonna approach it. The what and the causes of HABs, how to identify them, what the effects are. And in Pennsylvania, who to call and where to find the local advisories and some new things that we have done at the health department with the CDC. So to start, like I said, just a brief overview, harmful algal blooms or HABs, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're ancient. There's about 2,000 species, and they can be found in fresh and marine waters. Here in our little corner of the world, they're typically caused by cyanobacteria. And what's really cool about them is it's a bacteria that acts like a plant. So it's going to obtain its energy from nutrients and photosynthesis. The other thing is, well, by themselves, they may not be harmful. When those optimal conditions happen, they'll bloom and they may produce toxins. But the other thing to, to know is a lot of people do travel is that harmful algal blooms in other parts of the country and other parts of the world can be caused by other organisms like diatoms and dinoflagellates. So when we talk about the nutrients that they need to grow, those are what usually causes HABs to get out of control. Optimally, they want sunlight, but then when you have too much phosphorus and too much nitrogen, whether through agricultural runoff or malfunctioning septic systems, malfunctioning wastewater treatment plants or combined sewer overflows where the sewer system is combined with the wastewater treatment and you get heavy rains and you get an overflow from the sewage treatment plant, those excess nutrients are what's going to cause the, those cyanobacteria to bloom. And it's really interesting because recent research is showing that not just phosphorus, but nitrogen is also very important in bloom production, especially toxin production. So more phosphorus means bigger bloom, more nitrogen means potentially more toxic bloom. So, in and then typically what we see is usually midsummer, so like late June, early July, mid July, we would start seeing blooms occur and they can go anywhere into mid to late October, depending on how warm our waters stay locally. So what do they look like? Really cool thing is, is they, there's, there can be all sorts of colors. We typically see green in Lake Erie, but they can be blue or brown or gold, even in red. And you may see red in Florida with the red tide. There may be some scum, some foaming, stuff accumulating on the shoreline. The one that I have seen personally is where it appears to be paint spilled on the surface. So it looks like somebody spilled latex paint and they usually in like a white or a blue or a green color. Um, sometimes you can see them and they look like little green balls of clump stuff formed in or just kind of like a liquidy heavy pea soup. These are a few pictures that 
I've accumulated. The top left of note, that's actually from the Western Basin of Lake Erie. And the bottom right is gonna be from a lake in Erie County that was a picture taken in 2009. So halves happen all the time. They happen everywhere. They've been happening for a while. So when these plumes happen like this, what can happen is they, those cyanobacteria can produce neurotoxins. And there's two types of neurotoxins that we look at. One is uh, the neurotoxin, which is uh, the nervous system, or a hepatic toxin that could attack the liver. And in our little corner of Lake Erie, we work with the Regional Science Consortium and what they do every summer for us um, is test for four separate toxins. Microcystis, microcystin, cylindrospermopsins, those are typically hepatic toxins, toxins that could attack the liver. Anatoxin A and saxitoxin are typically your neurotoxins, which would attack the neurosystem. The interesting thing about saxitoxin is it's found in fresh and marine water. So you may sometimes hear about saxitoxin poisoning in um, shellfish um, patches that may be growing on, on the coasts. Now, when we talk about how do those toxins get into our body? How, you know, what is our potential exposure pathways for humans? There's several different pathways. One could be drinking water that is contaminated with those toxins. Another way is through a dermal contract, swimming, splashing, wading in the water that may have those, those blooms. Um, as I mentioned before, you could get them through ingestion of food, shellfish, potentially fish. There's still a lot of studies going on right now with regards to fish and fish in Lake Erie. The other one that has a lot of studies coming up is inhalation through water droplets where the toxin would be in the little water droplets. And when you boat or jet ski, those, those droplets could come up and you could inhale those toxins. So as a result, we have lots of different potential effects in humans. Um, I've seen dermal uh, reaction. I had an intern who had a break in her waders and when she went out in the water to collect a sample, she came back and she was rashy from where the waders were. Um, so dermal, can, dermal uh, rash can happen, but other things, not, if you ingest it, you could have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, nervous system could be tingling, burning, numbness. So there's a lot of things. The other thing though too is that some of these symptoms will be the same as some other common things like a dry cough could be a cold, um, sore throat could be something else. So it's very imperative that you pay attention to your symptoms and where you have been to potentially rule out any water related issues. The other thing that's really big for Erie is we love our dogs and we love to take our dogs to Presque Isle. So we have to be conscious of what are the exposure pathways and the symptoms in pets. And we have to remember that a dog weighs less than a human. So if they're ingesting water, they're ingesting more potential toxins per their body weight than maybe say a six foot tall, 200 pound man would. The other thing is, is how they behave really does dictate how much they're ingesting. They love to lick their fur after swimming. They love smelly algal scum, so they may roll in it or they may eat it. And even when they swim, they're swimming, their faces and their mouth are at water level. So they are also potentially drinking the water in. So you're gonna see onset of, onset of symptoms in pets a lot quicker than potentially people. And that's just a few, a few of the symptoms that you may see. Um, the other thing to note is we saw those really nasty pictures of those harmful algal blooms. We have to remember that toxins can occur after a bloom dissipates. So water may be crystal, what you think is crystal clear, but there may be toxins in the water. And we don't know that unless we actually have tests done on that water to determine those toxins. So that goes to the point that's really common 
that a lot of people say in the summer, a lot of agencies say, if you're in doubt, stay out of the water. So if in doubt, stay out. But what do you do if you've come in contact with water that may have a potential or confirmed harmful algal bloom? If you think that you may have been in contact, what you wanna do is wash your hands, take a shower, bathe anybody who may have been in contact with that water, especially your pets. You wanna get anything that could be on their fur off. Um, try not to swallow anything. I, I know it's hard when we take our little kids to the beach and they wanna just put everything in their mouth. Um, so we try not to discourage that kind of thing. If the water looks discolored in any way, don't, I, I wouldn't even venture wading into it. Um, the other thing is, is that you would want to pay attention to if there's any advisories or closures because of those haps. Um, so what happens if you or your pet show signs of being ill or of poisoning from, from harmful algal blooms? If you feel sick in any way, contact your doctor. If your dog is exhibiting any signs, contact a veterinarian, or you can also contact poison control. I do recommend you keep these two numbers on hand, not just for HABs, but for everything. Um, the first number is for humans and the second phone number listed is going to be specifically for pets. Now, because this is from, D from the DEP's website, if you have any health-related questions regarding HABs, you can contact them directly at the um, environment or in dot health.concerned at pa.gov. Um, we here in the health department down in environmental, we are not medical professionals. So we can tell you what to look for, but we can't, we can't diagnose you. And the same with our, our partners at the Science Consortium. They're not medical professionals. So you have health-related questions, definitely go to your doctor or you can contact that email. Um, if you suspect any HAPS, what you would want to do is contact the Pennsylvania HAPS Task Force at HAPS.PA or HAPS at PA.gov. And, you know, they will get back to you. So what do we do here in, Pen in our little Erie? We have a web map and here's the two links. First link takes you directly to the map. And the map is nice because it not only has um, those HAB advisories, and we, the Science Consortium will take tests all along the lakeshore and all around Presque Isle. So we go pretty much from Ohio over to New York. Um, you can also see beach advisories on here well, as well. So it's kind of like a one-stop shopping. The other, the other link is going to take us, take you to the Erie County's website that has additional information. So if you're just looking for the map, the first link will take you there. If you want additional information regarding HABs, you can go to the second link. Um, if you're traveling out of state, a lot of other states do have HAB programs, HAB websites. It's really easy. Just Google the state you're going to. Example, Ohio Habs. And usually it's going to be the first couple links that are going to come up where they have their website. Like I said, Habs is very ubiquitous across the country. We think of it as like a Lake Erie issue, but Iowa has their own map for Habs. Virginia has their own map. So a lot of states do have that information so that if you're traveling, especially if you're going to somewhere along the coast or has a lot of swimming areas, it doesn't hurt to check to see what they're doing too. And as you go further south and west, their Hab issues run much, much longer than ours do. And in Florida, it's some places it's running year round. So it's always good to be cautious and at least have the knowledge whether you're being local or travel. So I did talk a little bit at the beginning that we have entered into a program with the CDC and it's called OHAPS or One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System. And what it is is One Health is a surveillance system that is done where we look at not just human health, but the health of the environment and the health of animals because we're all interconnected. 
Um, animals are the sentinels of our environment. They tell us if there's an issue and environmental groups have known this for decades where we see animals, the populations decline and it says there's something wrong with the environment, then in turn says something might could be wrong with people. So this is something that CDC started and piloted in 2014. Um, they went live, I believe, 2016 or 15 with, with a few states reporting. We started reporting all of the environmental data that we've gotten from the Regional Science Consortium to the CDC in 2018. We've been reporting data we went back to 2016 to report and we report data every year. You can, what you can report is um, environmental data, which is what we do, uh, but you can also report animal illnesses and human illnesses. And what CDC does is they do a, basically a data dump at the end of the year, common, put all that data together and kind of do reports. Their first report was actual report, kind of boring reading. Um, two links to it if you would like to read it. I like what they're doing now, which are these really cool infographics. So they take all of that information that's in the report and just come, just shorten it into this really nice infographic. Um, as you can see that 14 states participated in reported data in 2019. They We had a total of 200 and 42 events. What's interesting is the 367 animal illnesses. Most of that is wildlife, but you can report domestic animals and pets to that as well. Um, they have closed out our 2020 and 2021 data, so I suspect that we should be getting some sort of reports like this here in the near future. So that's kind of been a really nice thing. So hopefully more states will start participating. It's all voluntary. We, you know, you, we don't have to do it if we don't want to, but it's good to report to show what the data, what the data is saying, where are the issues, who's having those issues, and maybe someday we'll get more funding for HABs. With that, here's a whole bunch of other resources that we. Um, that I personally use. I find the EPA and the CDC websites are really good information. Um, DEP has got their website is very good too. Um, and with that, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Chelsea. That was a fantastic introduction to our summer um, and what we need to be on the lookout for. And I do see Brian dropped the link to the Pennsylvania Habs Task Force webpage into the chat. So please visit that. And Karen Tobin says, good job, Chelsea. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, yeah. So with the OHABs data, is the hope to eventually be able to use this data for predictive purposes? They have not said anything about predictive purposes. So I know that you can't, the way the federal government works, you can't, you can't give money out if you don't know what the problem is. And, you know, I think this is a way to show what the problem is. Um, I, the problem with predictive modeling is it's so location specific because you need so many different variables. And the problem is at different points, different places in the country, harmful algal blooms are caused by different organisms. So that's the other thing. I know locally um, for the Western Basin, they are trying to do a toxin predictive model. I don't know how well that's gonna work and I don't know where they are with it, but I know because now we know that nitrogen is that push for the toxins. So I think, I think predictive models are gonna be more localized than nationalized. Great, thank you so much. Yep. And Tim, do you have anything else for Chelsea? No, thanks for the information, Chelsea. And, and indeed, you know, predictive models ha have been, you know, often held as the panacea for, for, for us going off into, uh, you know, harmful algal bloom forecasting. The thing is, is that 
you're right. They're, they're notoriously difficult to get all of those different variables inside the model just right. Um, and, and conditions are constantly changing. So um, that being said, some of our, our best advice is to keep an eye out, um, be safe uh, and sound around the water, and uh, don't go in if it looks like there's a habit there. But I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Amber. I know we only have a few minutes left, and we certainly want to get the information out there for our Earth Day. Yes, absolutely. Um, Tim, are you seeing my Earth Day screen? Yes. Okay, so I don't I, I encourage people to still put their questions in the chat for Chelsea. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left so I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. Um, thank you so much Chelsea for that wonderful presentation about harmful algal blooms. Now if you are interested in attending any of these Earth Day events, uh, some of them are coming up pretty quick. So what I encourage you to do is get out your phone and take pictures of the events that are upcoming if they sound interesting to you. I'm gonna run through them pretty fast and some of them are coming this weekend so that might not give you a great chance to uh, get our video from today's um, webinar and then attend the, uh, the event. So we might miss you. So get your phones out, get ready. I'm gonna run through through our Erie Earth Day extravaganza. So the first event I want to feature is a Trash to Treasure art show screen and screening of The True Cost. This is going to occur at Bruno's Cafe on uh, this Friday. The screening will occur at 2 p.m. and there will be a bunch of trash and show entries on display in Bruno's Cafe all day. Uh, this uh, documentary is about the true cost of fashion to the environmental world. And I highly recommend you either watch it or attend the free screening on Friday. The next event is through Asbury Woods and the Erie County Public Library. It is a build your own bee hotel extravaganza. Uh, there are several events listed here. And the first one occurs on Friday from one to two at the Edinburgh Library. And there are several others occurring after that. If you're interested in learning how to build a bee hotel, take a picture. Uh, they will have everything that, they, that um, you need to build your own bee hotel to provide space for pollinators in your backyard. The next event is Erie's actual Earth Day celebration. And I personally am attending this one. So if you wanna come say hi, I encourage you to do so. On April 23rd, that's this Saturday from 12 to noon, there will be a celebration in Perry Square with lots and lots of environmental organizations and local partners. And I believe Jenny Tompkins is speaking. So you'll get the chance to hear her uh, talk again. And that their, um, their theme is to invest in our planet. So come join us and learn a little bit about what you can do on this Earth Day to invest in your planet. The next event is also occurring on April 23rd at 4 p.m. And I'm also attending this one. So maybe come to both. We can hip hop together down uh, to Dobbins Landing after we leave Perry Square. This is the national water dance in Erie called the Ripple Effect. And this is a combined effort uh, between local partners and Mercyhurst Institute for Arts and Culture. And uh, if you want more information about that, you can see the website right there. Uh, but they are working to merge dance, art, music, and science at this event. So I encourage you to come out and support your community members at this amazing, amazing um, opportunity to see art and science mixed together. Next up, we have the drop in and discover at Asbury Woods. This occurs every um, Saturday at, uh, at Asbury Woods. And this Saturday, it is from 11 to noon. It's free, there's no registration required. It's sponsored by UPMC and you can just hop in and learn every, about everything that Asbury Woods has to offer. The next one is the City Nature Challenge, and this is occurring a little bit later in April, uh, but this is a, an effort by Asbury Woods and local partners to uh, create a community of science that will identify a ton of different organisms all around Erie County, anywhere north of I-90. It's called a bio blitz, and you'll use the tool iNaturalist on your phone in order to um, identify plants, insects, um, 
amphibians if you want to, reptiles, all kinds of things. That bio blitz is occurring from April 29th through May 2nd, and there are tons of community walks listed on Asbury Woods website, but you don't have to join a community walk in order to uh, participate. You can do this on your own through the uh, iNaturalist app. Next up, we have It's More Than Just Dirt. This is a uh, remake learning day hosted by the uh, Warren County Conservation District through the IU5. And this is occurring on May 20th from 6.30 to 7.30 at the Hatch Run Conservation Demonstration Area, where you will learn all about soil. So go to that website to uh, reserve your spot. The next event is also a remake learning event occurring on May 21st from uh, noon to two in the uh, Northwest Senior High School in Albion. And this is a partnership between the Albion Area Public Library and the IU5 to get people outdoors and um, help them understand uh, what, uh, how they are um, impacting with their environment interacting with their environment when they are outdoors. There will be a reading of the true story of the three little pigs and lots and lots of crafting tables and all ages are welcome. So go to that link to reserve your spot. This is a personal plug for the Get Outside with Master Watershed Stewards event that Penn State Extension is hosting. This is occurring on May 21st from 10 to noon at Frontier Park. We will be exploring Cascade Creek and learning about the potential effects of outdoor recreation and the natural environment. And we are teaming up with urban forestry from Erie and Crawford counties to do this event. There is limited space, so go to the website and reserve your spot in order to walk with us and learn with us. And then finally, we have Swim Into Summer with Steam. This is occurring on May 23rd at 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. in Cambridge Springs. And uh, pre-K students, kindergarten, and grades one through six are all welcome. You will arrive, you'll pick up a kit to learn all about the ocean. And uh, there's a couple other things in there for uh, bubbling, bubble shell painting, and some the uh, learning the fun science of uh, swimming fish and things like that. So go to the website to reserve your kit and uh, learn more about the ocean. So happy Earth Day. I hope you all have an amazing, amazing Earth Day. Um, and I encourage you to get out and do something to celebrate our planet and the wonderful things it has offered to us and learn more about what you can do for it. Oh, and Karen, Karen says the Prescott Isle cleanup is this Saturday. So if you are interested in signing up, uh, I believe you can go to the DCNR website um, or you can probably just show up. They probably have plenty of bags and gloves. I still haven't decided which one I want to go to yet. There's too many, um, That's but it's great. And you have such an, uh, a, a, you know, a wide array of events across the region to participate in. So I encourage everyone to get out this weekend and in the coming weeks to, uh, to show your support and lend a hand. And, uh, you know, with that, it's, uh, we're, we're at time here, so we have to close out the meeting. That being said, look for the questionnaire that's going to be coming out in email from Amber. It's only going to take you a couple of minutes, and we really appreciate your feedback in making this the best uh, vehicle for getting information to you. Uh, the, those who are interested in uh, the Lake Erie and Great Lakes uh, Basin. And, uh, and with that, I thank all of our speakers here today. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone uh, in July. Um, we don't have a date yet, but it'll be towards the end of July uh, for our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you.